It's easy to forget Need for Speed wasn't always like this. It took years of the game's community yelling in one clear direction to get Need for Speed to where it is today. After years of blockbuster style epics, hot pursuits, realistic simulations, and other experiments, a massive group of fans won the Need for Speed back underground. Taking a low-cost sports car, customizing it to your heart's intent, and going out and racing on the street like you'd never be able to do in real life is what many people knew the Need for Speed name for. The fans wanted this kind of Need for Speed to come back. This led to several years of community campaigning, which ended up being a success because Need for Speed, as Speedhunter said, went under a serious reboot process over 18 months, which ended up being quite drastic. Need for Speed's 2015 reboot felt like a love letter to the Need for Speed community. But it wasn't just for going in the direction many fans wanted for the series, but going beyond what people had asked for on the surface level. It went deeper than just bringing back street racing, tuner cars, and car customization, because those terms can mean so many different things to the car community that might not exactly translate to what a Need for Speed fan would want. Need for Speed's 2015 reboot took a good look at car culture that made fans want it back in Need for Speed in the first place. Because you can't just rethink Need for Speed by going back and upscaling what you had made 10 plus years ago. You need to look outside of the box that you created and look into the bigger world that you influenced for so many people. And that's exactly what Need for Speed 2015 did. The game was full of the most popular wide body kits for cars at the time, new cars that the community was always talking about and centered its narrative around real world icons of car culture. All of this is really what made Need for Speed 2015 feel like a perfectly crafted time capsule. And it's what made the fans of the series feel so appreciated after many years of requests for the game they wanted. I know my voice probably won't get heard, but hopefully, hopefully someone from Black Box, EA Canada, or anywhere from EA will see this video. But Need for Speed 2015 didn't just give back to its fans in making a game that catered to its hungriest fan base. It paid tribute directly to those fans within the game itself. Whether your following was big or small, 100 or 100,000, Near Street 2015 included these tributes in a form we interact with constantly in racing games. We read these lines presented to us and share them with others playing these games just naturally without even thinking about it. They're such a normal part of these games that most of them just go over our heads. But Near Street 2015 has kept these tributes front and center in the game with most people not noticing a thing. Until now. This is the hidden story of Need for Speed 2015. So if these tributes are so hidden, how exactly do I know about them? I was able to gain contact with many of these community members and was able to ask them a few questions. The first thing I'd like to ask is, who are you? And how were you represented in game? I am Black Panther and my event in 2015 was Drift Like a Panther. So the event in the game that's named after me is CJ Tastic. It's a highway race um, that you unlock towards the end of the game. And during the campaign, it's actually one of the races where you face off against Magnus Walker, which is really cool to see the event named after me be one of like very high importance where you're like 1v1ing. Hi guys, this is Core speaking, but a lot of you might not know me as Core. You might know me as Marco Car Collector, and I am the person after which the event Marco's Collection in Need for Speed 2015 was named. So my event in Need for Speed 2015 was called Blue Cobra Blitz. 
It was a Gymkhana event. My name is Jesse. I was formerly known as RX Speedster, now currently running as Racing Experiment, and my event in Super Speed 2015 was Young Speedster. Hi, my name is Tariq Al Hamis. I had an event named after me in Need for Speed 2015, and it was called the Tarek Two Step. So my name is Nick. I used to have a YouTube channel that was called the Speedway Gamer. My name is Jonathan. People probably remember me as a uh, Jay Sarkody. Yeah, my event was Sarkody Speed, and it was like a it was pretty much like a little sprint race. It's quite cool actually. Hey there, everyone. My name is Chris. Back in the day, I used to be known as Racer X NFS, and nowadays I go by the nickname RX. And my event in this game is Angel at the Red Line. This is based off of my Twitter handle at the time, and still is to this day, which was at Angel at Red Line. That was quite the revelation, huh? I can't name another racing game that has done anything like this. Because of this unique practice, it makes you wonder, how did this all happen in the first place? So, what was the process of getting your name in the game like? I was actually involved with 2015 from a really early stage. They flew me out, I got to see the game when it was like, one area was finished, and we were driving a square around the map. I am allowed to say that, don't worry. So it's pretty much just asked if I wanted to be in the game, which is cool, because like, I, they, I felt like I had a significant part. I checked my Twitter DMs and I got a DM from James Mount. He asked me um, if I wanted, you know, my name to be featured in the game. I had to sign either an NDA or something, basically keeping it secret until the game launched. As a surprise, because it just I just woke up one day, checked my Twitter DMs, and, you know, it was right there. It was over the summer of 2015. So back in 2014, I messaged the Need for Speed Facebook page and I sent them a whole wall of text of suggestions and I didn't really make much of it. Like if they wanted to implement them, that's fine. So then about a year later in 2015, uh, about summer of 2015, I believe it was, and I got a, a, a Twitter message from uh, James, the lead designer of Need for Speed 2015 at the time. He reached out to me and he told me about this thing where to give back to the community they would name different events in the game after these people. And I was one of the people that they chose, one of the 20 people that they chose to have an event named after them. I was 13 years old at the time, and I thought that this was the coolest thing ever. August of 2015, James sends me a message on Twitter out of nowhere and basically says he has a request of me, but to talk more about it, I need to promise to keep it to myself until Need for Speed ships. Am I interested in knowing more? Well, of course, I'm interested in knowing more. Spill the beans. And he tells me that he's working on finishing up Need for Speed, and he wants to include some fan names in as events in the game as a, a sign of appreciation for our support. He told me the event name was Blue Cobra Blitz, and if I'm interested, let, me, let him know. He can send me an NDA, and... We'll go from there. How I got into the game was community manager James Mart had sent me an email around August 2015. It was kind of within the tail end of my high school years. And I'd suddenly gotten this notification from him on Twitter saying, hey, we're going to be putting a bunch of people within the community to give them their own special events in the game named after them. And when I saw this, I was very, very excited. So as soon as I got the email, uh, signed the non-disclosure agreement, sent it off to him. And within a couple months later, they put it in the game. It's kind of a crazy story because I was in a vacation far from my home city. When I was casually browsing Twitter on my iPad, out of nowhere, the community manager of Nitro Speed at the time has followed me and sent me a DM message on Twitter. I was in disbelief. I had to double check if it was not a random troll or something. Then I read his message in which he vaguely asked me if I was interested in his offer in regards to Need for Speed but on the condition that I will not tell anyone about it until Need for Speed 2015 ships. I very enthusiastically replied with, yes, I will not tell anyone, no matter who. The problem was, I was on a vacation and I did not have a scanner or a printer at hand. So what I did is, I rushed to the nearest bookstore to print the legal paper and scan it. Thankfully, I managed to sign it and send it to him on time. I got a DM on Twitter one night on uh, at the beginning of 2015 
he basically told me that I couldn't say anything, but they wanted to include my YouTube channel name as an event name in Need for Speed 2015. And he basically told me to sign a paper that I had to scan, where it was basically the, the NDA in which I stated that they could use my name and um, for me to not say anything about the project. The process of getting my name in, it was a bit weird because see, back then I was literally like 14, 15 years old. Everyone begging for Underground Free was is like ridiculous, isn't it? They were basically taking public feedback um from basically people on twitter i'm pretty sure they probably reached out to other people as well but the community on twitter is quite huge out of the blue one time he basically sent me a dm he was like do you want to put your name in a game we wanted to like surprise select fans but obviously because of like data protection and all that kind of stuff they couldn't really do it without our permission for a lot of people i'd argue the majority of people their in their name being added into the game was a complete surprise however this wasn't true of a certain marco car collector who now goes by the name of core interesting thing about that is that led to around the launch of the closed beta for need for speed back on consoles marco actually wound up reaching out for me saying i've got a little bit of a secret they've got something i wanted to show you and he wound up showing me a picture from the closed beta of the event with my name on it which left me absolutely stunned still does to this day having to sign an nda and keep your mouth shut because you know you're in the next need for speed game must be quite the feeling Speaking of, how exactly does being featured in the year 2015 make you remember the game differently from the average player? I mean, to have your name in a game and an event named after you, it seems like just kind of a small thing. It's like having an AI player named after you or something similar, but it, it's such a, a, a mind-blowing thing for a game to launch, not modified, with my name in it. I would say it makes it infinite. However, uh, 2015 is an always online game. <laughs> So, uh, not quite infinite. It gives me um, goosebumps to this day, just thinking that, you know, I have some sort of recognition in my favorite video game series, a series I've been playing for <laughs> about 20 years at this point. Um, it, it's a really warm, it's a really nice feeling that I get. And um, I'm super grateful, I'm super thankful to James Mountain Ghost Games as a whole. Uh, for being able to be even just a small part of uh, the franchise. They didn't just, obviously they included like big boys, but um, they really went into the community and shouted out people who weren't big in the community, but like still had sizable followings. And even with me, because at the time I had less than a thousand subscribers. I think I only had like 500, 600 subscribers at the time. Like you don't see that type of stuff just in gaming as a whole. You don't see the type of um, connection that Ghost Games was trying to build back in the day. As somebody who has been a Need for Speed fan since well over 15 years, to be honest with you, I've played all of the major releases of Need for Speed. And it's the only video game franchise every year that I actually follow and get excited about. And you know, having my name in a Need for Speed game sort of immortalized in an event, and also that the fact that it was such an important Need for Speed game because it brought back a lot of the things that we love, we all, we've always loved about Need for Speed, and that we missed up until that point. It's a very special feeling, and you know, I think back to that every once in a while. And I haven't told a lot of people about this in my real life friend circles and stuff but every time i sort of look back i remember and i'm like holy sh there's an event in a need for speed game that's named after me and some people have had uh problems believing me that this is true but it is and it's an amazing and really special feeling and i'm endlessly grateful to james and the entirety of the ghost team for implementing this having that as well as some of my other close friends and companions like having our names in the game, it just, it represents such a special time in I'm sure all of our lives, especially mine. You know, I just got my first car and I got to drive to GameStop to buy Need for Speed where my name is in the game. The same game that like Ken Block and Knock Eyes Saw and Magnus Walker, like all these people are like, 
a part of this. And it's like, it was just so cool to see. So I remember that time very fondly. Oh my gosh, just being in class and in, in high school, just thinking about the game and, and just getting hyped about every trailer and everything that happened with that game. It was, it was a really, really fun time. And I, I really hope that Need for Speed can kind of rekindle that again someday. It does feel very nice to be in the Need for Speed game and it makes me feel, remember the game a lot more differently than the average player because, you know, having to go through those months and months waiting for me at my event to pop up in the game and then eventually getting a hold of the game, I think it was very, very special indeed. It didn't influence my whole opinion of the game whatsoever. It was still very nice to have a piece of history in Need for Speed for myself. So it was pretty cool indeed. I was so excited as the sole thought of Having my name as a big Need for Speed fan displayed to millions of players was unbelievable, it was insane. But today, as of this recording, with the sad news of Ken Block's passing, it hit me the hardest, actually. I came to the realization that James, Ghost Games and Need for Speed didn't just give me the honor of being named in the game, but also the honor of being in the game that has legend like Ken Block. And the fact that I now has something in common with him, it's the fact that we both have events that reference us both in the same game, which is huge. I just cannot express how grateful I am to this day for that. This is exactly why I will still be a very loyal Need for Speed fan, no matter how low the lows get or how high the highs of the series get. Honestly, it's something so simple, but it just lasts a lifetime, man. Honestly, it just makes me feel um, really good. I was a really small channel back in the day in 2015. I had around uh, 500 subscribers, which wasn't a lot. And the fact that a AAA studio actually noticed you was a really big deal because not only did it meant that I was kind of doing things right, but it also meant that they were paying attention to smaller content creators on the platform. But I still do remember the game fondly just because of the fact that I was somehow, some way involved with it. And, you know, my channel is no more and stuff like that it's, it's still like really personal to me and it's it gives me a really nostalgic feeling i was overjoyed um yeah it was quite cool the thing is with me is that um my friends like me personally i didn't really have many friends that were into like need for speed really from what i remember i don't know i couldn't really share it with my friends too much but like you know my brother my uncle played need for speed quite a bit as well um, yeah, we spoke about it and like, yeah, like a little celebration between us. To this day, I still I still feel humbled about that. I, I can't really imagine anyone going out of their way to do this. I didn't have a modern console at that time, you know, PS4, Xbox One, and I had mostly migrated to PC. So I didn't get to play the game until later when the PC port of Need for Speed 2015 dropped. The event that was named after me was a story event tied to the player character really starting to hunt down recognition among the other characters in the game. And clearing the event also gives you an achievement. When I found that out, I made it all the more impactful for someone like me. It was kind of perfect. A speed run tied to, important, tied to the sort of important story moment and my nature in playing racing games is as someone who just loves to go flat out, get the soundtrack going, and have an absolute jam session with the foot to the floor. And it's how I pride myself in playing racing games to this day. It's how I relax, it's how I vibe, it's how I feel free. So to have that in an event with my name on it was frankly more than humbling. It was unbelievable. I remember going into a GameStop not long, I think it was a little after, I don't remember if it was after the game launched or after I had played it, but there was a Prima strategy guide on the shelves for Need for Speed, and I opened it up, I looked through the events, and there was an entire sub-chapter dedicated to just each event in the game, including that with my name on it. 
And I want you to think for a brief moment what it's like to be in the store looking at a book, seeing your digital pseudonym, your name, your identity written in the book in this discreet way and seeing copies upon copies of this book being printed out and just realizing that's that was out of respect that's my name in there i don't know if you can tell by the way i speak but it's still it's it's so weird to me it's 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 humbling it feels like something that shouldn't have happened i don't and never considered myself anyone important i was and still am just someone who likes to talk about and vibe with racing games so to be included even for a game that I have a, quite a few gripes with is nothing short of an honor, a privilege, one hell of a memory, and one hell of a way to have a legacy, especially through a franchise that I grew up playing as far back as my single digit years as a child. I don't know how to feel about it to this day. It's been an occasional talking point on, like, like, as just like, the sort of thing that you throw out in the middle of a conversation is like a uh, an interesting little fact, a tidbit, a conversation starter. But when you really, really think about it, it's so, so, so much more than that, that having to talk about it feels unfathomable. You can tell in every element of this game, through every decision, good or bad that there was a ridiculous amount of heart and passion in every element of this game something that i actually don't think i've seen ever since <sighs> that was a lot to take in i don't think it's surprising though considering so much of our stories with need for speed the thought of not being an established creator even in a day where those weren't really much of a thing and having your name in the need for speed game seems too crazy to be true. But this leads me to ask, who was responsible for this in the first place? James Mao. James. James. James Mao. James. James Mao. Okay, okay, I got it, I got it. Thankfully, we were able to get an interview with James, not only learning just about the origin of this story, but learning about some never before seen secrets about Near C 2015's and Rival's development. You're about to be strapped in for a high speed interview with one of Neater Speed's lead designers. When were you attached to this project and how far back did you go with Ghost Games when this was all starting out? So I was brought on to Ghost Games uh, at the start for Need for Speed Rivals prior to the reboot. Uh, my job there was to build the design department. Ghost was built originally to be a Need for Speed studio. Uh, and it was likely going to make a lot of stuff for the Need for Speed in the future. We know how that ended up turning out, unfortunately. But what they needed to do was build it from the ground up to be uh, basically a partner or a sister studio to the Criterion guys who are also working on Need for Speed at the time. So my job was to build the design department. So around the time Need for Speed Rivals was nearing completion, I imagine that you guys already had a vision for the direction that you wanted to take 2015 going forward. How much of that was influenced by the community? Things like car customization and overall thoughts. <laughs> a big part of what we were trying to tap into was what made Need for Speed great to the biggest number of Need for Speed fans. The Need for Speed has had so many different iterations that there's no one best version, depending on who you ask, right? You're 100% guaranteed to offend someone no matter what direction you pick. But ultimately, what, what we knew we wanted to do was tap into the, the, the Speed Hunters uh, information and group that we had access to. We wanted to really reflect car culture and take it back to the roots of what a lot of people felt was the best part of Need for Speed, which is the, the more underground feeling uh, even though it wasn't underground in title, that was a lot of the inspiration for it. Uh, but also make sure that it, it tapped into something new and interesting that was relevant. So that's why you ended up seeing a lot of the, the icons that were in that game. Yeah, that's very true, especially with how many of them would um, continue to influence car culture even after <laughs> the game released. Hell, you saw the massive outpouring of support when one of them w well, passed away earlier this yeah. year. Having seen that news, it was very, very sad that uh, Ken, unfortunately, is not with us anymore. And like, I, I was fortunate enough to work with him for uh, a number of times on that project, uh, both during the development and as we went out to Gamescom and stuff like that to do the, the promotional stuff. Great guy. Like, 
no ego despite the fact that he is he was and, and continues to be someone who defined car culture for years at a time that's honestly a pretty beautiful thing to hear so i guess i might as well ask what was your favorite part about working on the uh, need for speed reboot the biggest thing that we had that uh, excited me was we were coming off of uh the, the need for speed arrival so we had a lot of the tech in place we weren't building it from scratch we could start to improve upon and refine what we were building if you talk to most game developers they'll say that making the first game is tough but making the sequel like making two uh in, in the series is is the exciting part where you get to say okay i have a whole bunch of tools i, I don't need to build a lot of them now what am i going to do with this instead of how do we even make something from scratch uh so standing that game up was really exciting and the fact that i think we took it in a direction that uh some people liked it some people hated it but we tried to tie it into this sense of like you are you are in this game you're not just like an avatar it's you in the game it's your experience it's trying to draw you into it be it from the first person cutscenes to the car that you customized put into real world environments digitally composited in re real time like some of that tech was amazing stuff at the time that no one was doing and it was one of the things that when I saw what the art team was able to put together in our tests with having your car as you customize it, whichever car you wanted, whichever customization you put on it, blending it, blending a 3D scene of that garage into the the real time or the, uh, excuse me, the, the real world footage we filmed of that, that environment and the actors and putting that all together. It was amazing. Th there's definitely been lots of discussions about the style of how the, the cutscenes and the narrative and the acting was executed fine <laughs> there's always going to be those discussions but i think the technology and the artistry that those guys put into making those things come together it still to this day stands up extremely well and i also really enjoyed the fact that we went with the the live action cutscenes. It, it it harkens back to not only uh, a part of the need for speed franchise uh with the storytelling with live actors but also to a time of gaming that i'm really fond of like you, you go back to the red alerts and stuff where they had actors on the on the screen doing it not digital versions of actors I don't know, there's something nostalgic about it. It felt fun. I, I can remember uh, when we started getting feedback about this stuff uh, when the game launches, like people weren't sure is is that a real car and you like or is that a digital actor? Is that a like a 3D model of an actor? Like how did they do this? Whereas now you look at stuff like Unreal uh, powering the Mandalorian uh, shoots, right? They've got the whole uh, surrounded environment and stuff. We didn't have any of that. It was a lot of like ground up tech that they built for that. And it was amazing that they could build it so convincingly so being that how many directions need for speed can can go in and how many different things have been done with the franchise in your opinion what would your own perfect need for speed game be if you had all the power to make any need for speed game you could want that is hard to say uh i think ultimately some of the stuff that i want to get in there i don't think we can ever truly get in there uh because need for speed taps into real world manufacturers right you got your Anything from like a Honda through to a Ferrari or Lambo on on your roster of cars. And that's great. That's part of the fantasy. But unfortunately, all of those manufacturers have extremely different requirements for how you can or can't refer to their car, how you can or can't modify it, how, like all sorts of things. Right. And so it sets up a maze uh, of uh, how you can or can't do things. And I think like when when you look at uh, i think the the best example is need for speed porsche unleashed it's very much focused on a single car and they 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 boiled that down like it's a it's about a porsche it's not about anything you want what i would love to do is something much more like grounded in what people are truly doing with their their vehicles it's that yeah i may have a lambo but i'm going to put some custom aftermarket stuff on there and i'm going to change out i may not want this thing or i may want to change the turbos or this is or that's once you get into that really specific stuff, like I want to change out this engine for that engine. I want to use a Honda engine in uh, a Ferrari. Nope, <laughs> you are not going to have that happen, right? But that is what we, what like hardcore uh, guys really get into. It's like, how can we make the best version of a thing and how can we tune it and chop it and change it? Regarding what you did with the community or the game in general, if there was something that you could redo, look back, if you're looking back on it right now and you can change it, is there anything that you would have done differently? Th there's always something you do differently on a game. Uh, yeah, I know. It's a bit of a loaded you know. question. It's pretty boilerplate. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's kind of an aspect of anything creative. Yeah. The, of the, course. Like, when when is the last brush stroke on a painting, right? You can always add one more. If you look at the scoring system, it's an evolution of the risk-reward scoring system that I built for Rivals. It was interesting because it helped reinforce the different ways to play and the, the fact that there was different storylines and this and that. I don't feel it ever really fully landed, though. When I look at uh, competitors in like Forza, the Forza scoring system does the job in a way that I don't think the, the scoring system for 2015 did. 
it, it was something that I think did the job. I, I would have loved to improve. Uh, I know we have a lot of scrap designs about car customization. I would have loved to explore those further. It's probably for the best that they didn't make it in, knowing um, EA's penchant for just squeezing every last dollar out of people uh, rather than mm. making the best, just the best <laughs> game. Uh, and their their intention was very much they wanted to find what the FIFA Ultimate Team for Need for Speed was. Like, how could they do that? So I'm glad we never actually got there, but it only ever didn't happen uh, because of the cost associated with building it from the ground up for Need for Speed at the time. When we had to look at the, the, the scope of the project and how we were going to make this game to come together, all of the core bits of the game took all of our scope. And so that just made the decision. We have to cut that thing, no matter how badly EA wants something like that to microtransact in, for both uh, uh, something in Rivals and then something in uh, 2015. All right, so one thing that was that, that's always been apparent to me about Need for Speed uh, since after 2015 is that 2015's updates uh, to the game were completely free of charge and they were also very strong on adding um, fresh content features and fixing the game uh, of the, the issues that it had, for example, adding manual transmission, right? And those, the, the, the heft of those updates were like really, really good. That's not something that I think I've seen in Need for Speed after, uh, with the game after 2015. And I was curious, I remember being disappointed with, because it felt like it was kind of cut short. Um, the update stopped in May with the Speedless update. Was there any bigger expansions or updates planned for 2015 that couldn't make it? Or was that about it? Sadly, I can't tell you much about that. Not because I don't want to, but I left the project shortly after we launched. How do you feel about 2015's always online requirement? What happened there? All, all of the issues we had, that wasn't really the thing that I was freaked out about by the time we launched. <laughs> I'm struggling to remember the always online stuff that we had with 2015. Some games like this one, because it was built uh, around the sense of like, you're, you're trying to have this social experience with other players. The online part was inescapable. We couldn't we couldn't just like duplicate it and say you have an offline and you do that separate and the online. We'd already proven that was very interesting and exciting in Rivals. As I said, that feature very nearly didn't survive. <laughs> uh, there's a funny story there I can tell you about later if you want. Technically, there's reasons why you need these authentication servers, you need this stuff to stand up and work. And if you don't want to go that route, you may be actually doubling your, your development cost because you have to basically duplicate lots of stuff, right? It's not a matter of just like copy and paste online campaign, offline campaign, right? Even if that was the case, you'd still have to have QA go through and test twice as much stuff now, let alone the fact that some of the stuff you may have set up with very clear multiplayer ideas in mind, and now you have to make alternate versions of it that don't require multiplayer uh, functionality or what. It's it's very hard to balance all these factors. I would always want a version where the player doesn't have to care about that. Um, but as a developer, that's an unavoidable if you're making a game with an online experience these days. You're going to have to find a way through it. That, that also plays nicely with your budget and the, the time you got to, to make the game. So if you don't mind, how did All Drive almost not survive? In the, the days leading up to the launch of Rivals, uh, and this was a very formative experience for me as a designer, especially like I, when I took the, the, the lead design role and was building the design team at Ghost for, for Rivals, it was the first time I'd stepped into a lead role. Uh, and I look back on it and I cringe on some of the ways and decisions and thoughts I had at the time, but that's growth. And one of the things that we really learned is that for the, the bulk of the project, the design team was talking about multiplayer X. Like, this is the way we think X is going to work from a, a player's point of view. Uh, and whenever they talked to the coders, they were telling them this is the kind of things we need, this is how it's going to function. And the coders believed, well, you want multiplayer, that's why. And whenever we talked back and forth, we all thought we wanted the same thing. But it wasn't until, I think, a few weeks before we were at our final launch date that we realized, holy f***, our multiplayer system doesn't work right. Like, this thing just isn't what we thought it was technically from a design point of view. And from a technical point of view, this isn't what we thought design wanted. When we scale this up past, like, the handful of test servers that we were using, this is going to just fall apart <laughs> uh and what we were trying to do is like create that sense of like you didn't have to match make you didn't have to go to like uh, a screen and pick a server you didn't have to worry about all that stuff you just you, you played your game and off you went and thank god the code team on uh rivals at ghost at the time was just like a crack team of guys because once we understood what was wrong and how it was all going to fall apart on us they got it fixed you know, like they they made it work in a couple of weeks and it's not to say it was just, oh, we'll just change a value here and it all works, but rather, 
oh shit, the architecture for this is just not right. And the, the gameplay is going to force this to fall apart. When it hit market, it worked. And it was it was a huge sigh of relief because we were all like, well, we're pretty sure this will work now. <laughs> but <laughs> you don't know because it's, it's different. No matter how many like internal tests or betas or anything you do with mm -hmm. thousands of people, it's, that's much different than when you start throwing millions of players at a thing. To an extent, of course, I knew these things. I'd always known that games were always so complex. But hearing it from someone like you definitely gives a, a whole new light. So thank you very much for the, for the commentary on that. So yeah, happy to. Uh, I have one more question to my knowledge. This is my last one. This one's a bit. This one's a bit wacky. Um, so Ben Walk from Ghost Games. I don't know if I'm pronouncing his last name right. He was community manager, and it was years later, after Need for Speed 2018, he said that the game's original name was Need for Speed Underground 3, and it was changed to be a <laughs> reboot weeks before release. Is this true? So a name of a game is always contentious, uh, and there's a lot of stuff that goes into it. Uh, sometimes you're very involved as a development team in uh, helping craft the name, sometimes you're not. Both Rivals and 2015 went through an extensive process about this. So uh, he's not wrong. Uh, I'm not sure about the exact timing. I'm pretty sure it was longer. Th that may be a, a slightly more dramatic version of it than I remember it to be. Uh, I think I think we kind of settled on the reboot uh, longer in advance than a few weeks um, because there's so much marketing and promotional material that comes into it. But he was on the marketing side more than I was, so maybe <laughs> it was that uncertain to a point where I, I thought we agreed and they were still uncertain for many more months. Even with Rivals, we went through the same process. Uh, and Rivals was originally going to be uh, uh, Hot uh, Pursuit? Yeah. Hop uh, that... Was it going to be Hot Pursuit 2? <sighs> yeah, I believe so. From a marketing perspective, because there was a console generation shift, there was... The, the decision was taken outside the development team that you can't release a sequel on a new console. It has to be a brand new thing. Uh, I think that's completely ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> There's plenty of examples in and outside of EA where that's still obviously not the case and it works just fine. But that was the that was the, ultimately the final reason why that one became its own thing. It became Rivals and not Hot Pursuit. But if you look at it, it's all of the Hot Pursuit DNA. It's weapons, it's cops, it's racers. It's, it's a Hot Pursuit game. What, what became 2015 and the underground uh, influence was very clear. It Should it be a sequel or should we be saying we're going to reboot the whole franchise? And ultimately, that became the more driving forces that we as a studio, as Ghost, are going to own the Need for Speed franchise and we're going to set the new direction for many uh, iterations to come. And this is why we're going to call it that rather than say this is just a sequel on top of. Because for all the good that it does to call yourself that, it also comes with baggage that maybe you're not going to succeed with, right? Like people have expectations from a Hot Pursuit or a Most Wanted or an Underground or any one of the, the types. As I mentioned very early on in our discussion, like there's no way you can satisfy everyone. That's why those decisions tend to get made is how does this best position this product in players' minds to have, have their expectations met and hopefully exceeded when they get the game. Like, yeah, this is everything I wanted and hopefully more. And they're, they're totally thrilled by it rather than I have 20 years worth of rose-tinted glasses on uh, Underground or my favorite Need for Speed game, and it's you called it that, but it's missing my favorite little feature, or you didn't put the same soundtrack in, or you didn't, like, who knows, right? It's really, really cool to hear, hear that commentary, not only about 2015, but also about Rivals, because I was going to say a part of my soul felt like it was answered <laughs> when you said that it was originally going to be called Hot Pursuit, because I remember uh, when I was 12 years old, I'm, I'm 22 now, hard to believe that was 10 years ago, um, Jesus, don't make me too feel too old now. <laughs> <laughs> but, 12 um, years old when you played yeah, that. Yeah, well, no, I was 12 when before Rivals came out, before it was fully revealed. I looked on the Need for Speed Facebook page and I saw one of its initial teaser photos, and I'm like, this is gonna be Hot Pursuit 2. It doesn't look like it's from real life at all. It looks like game graphics, which could be Hot Pursuit 2. Not the old Hot Pursuit 2, but the new Hot Pursuit 2 is what I was yeah. thinking, and then it was called Rivals. And it's like, now a part of my soul feels like it was answered. So thank you for the insight on that. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, that, that's actually one of those long secrets that I don't think anyone's ever really let go of. I just want to end off with that simple, lighthearted final question. What's your own favorite Need for Speed game? Is that really lighthearted, or are you trying to start a war? <laughs> like, obviously, from my point of view, like, the ones I made <laughs> uh, yeah, are hold a certain echelon it's hard to say this is the best one right because it's it's not a contiguous series of ever improving very much in the same brand as every other one 
I still like the the weapons based hot pursuit stuff the most, uh, and I, I was really excited to be able to work on what I thought was going to be hot pursuit two because of that. So the fact that you can imbue your cars with over the top weaponry uh, that you could still maybe imagine cars deploying, uh, they're kind of like next generation police hardware or these crazy sorts of things. That was cool. It gave us a lot more to work with, and I think it ultimately gives the player a lot more fun to do. That's not just can I take the apex of the corner just right, right? But ultimately, what I think I love the most is that more arcadey side of things. Because as a game designer, I want to make crazy cool stuff and have lots of ways to make it. So after watching 17 minutes of us interviewing James, you're probably wondering if we ever actually asked him what the story behind this whole situation was. Uh, it's a shockingly short story. I decided to do it. <laughs> um, what usually happens is you end up architecting all sorts of race events in a game like this. And you have dozens or hundreds and they all need names. Uh, and in some cases, I'm just writing goofy shit. Sometimes it's very related to what the, the event is about. Uh, but in, in the process of making both Rivals and Need for Speed 2015, I'd spend a lot of time interacting with you guys. Uh, and you guys are just yelling at me about stuff like, hey, what about this? What's going on with that? Uh, and it was interesting to hear all the stuff you're talking about. It was great to have that kind of passion in my ear at all, that, all, all times. And ultimately kept reminding me that we're not making this game for the executives at EA. Ultimately, yeah, they're in charge. <laughs> but we're making this game for the people that are going to play it. Uh, and some of these outspoken fans like, yeah, sure, there's some really big influencers. Uh, and that's cool. But it's not about like just who is the one big influencer and can we attach them to the project or this or that. But how can I effectively get a lot of this reference in there for the, the the people that know would appreciate seeing it right and the people that don't know it's just another goofy, goofy race name or it's a it's an odd thing that you don't understand and it, it costs us nothing essentially i have to do that anyway uh and it, it seemed like the right thing to do uh, so i did it uh and as soon as i started doing it uh, ea legal was like well wait a minute uh and so you probably remember getting a form in the mail I'm like yeah i need you to sign this to say you you're gonna let us do this uh, and a few people, uh, I think I sent out about 30 or 40 of them. Uh, a few people said they weren't interested, and that's fine. Like, I get it. Uh, for whatever reason, they, they weren't into it. But most people were like, yeah, this is cool. And it only reinforced that, like, this is going to make a lot of people happy and hopefully, again, again, draw the fact that, like, what we're trying to do is make games for the community, not just make games to, to sell games for the EA overlords. <laughs> as soon as I found out about this, I was just... I was completely taken aback personally. I would never have imagined anything quite like this. I don't think anyone in the community would have imagined anything quite like that because as far as video games go, while this has been changing slowly over time, it's still a relatively opaque business due to the nature of how things yep. are done, especially in AAA. So we're yep. kept very much in the distance, very hands-off, very look through the glass, that sort of thing. That was part of the, the goal, right? Was to try and get more more of the audience involved very visually uh, in the game, reach out and say, hey, you guys, this game is your game. It's it's not our game, right? It's This is the thing that you want and we're trying to make it. You're keeping an eye on the community. You're watching everything from behind the scenes. You're seeing all the reactions as they go live. What did you think of that as you saw it all unfold? Maybe more people were surprised than I, I, I was aware of. Um, I had gone through the process of sending out the forums, getting the signatures, getting it all returned, getting it legally squared away. Uh, and for, for, I assumed that they all understood what it was going to mean. Like, <laughs> um, So it, it was cool, uh, but I don't think a, a lot of that feedback actually ever reached me, to be quite honest. Like, I, I know a few people are like, hey, this is cool. And a few of them that, uh, that were speaking to me directly sent me messages. And I, I was happy to hear that they saw it. Uh, but I kind of suspected a lot of them didn't see it because I never heard about it. Yeah, I think we're. I, I think you're about to finally realize what just happened with that. Consi consi <laughs> all things considered, that's why we're working on this pro uh, video project in the first place because this is a very, uh, this is a very unique story, and a lot of people still hold it in high regard as this profound impact in terms of what the community means to the series and vice versa. Like for example, even though like I kind I kind of came into to the community at like at like the tail end, like Year 2015, which was just about to come out, so this was already kind of finalized. But I was already friends with uh, uh, Marco, who goes by Core now, and he was telling me about the situation. It was just so exciting, and the fact that I know like three different people, well, actually, no, like 
five probably to be honest that were part of this inclusion is just crazy it's in like what you mentioned earlier we didn't need to just have the big influencers have a spot in the game and this was honestly in a time before some of the big influencers became as big as they were like everyone yeah. was smaller than they were today to to an extent but even people that sometimes don't have like youtube channels around anymore sometimes people don't even have youtube channels in the first place but were just active with you and active in the community uh on places like twitter or whatever were featured in this and that's something that i just have so much respect for because to me it, it speaks volumes about new 2018 uh, in, in general to me because this game is how I met so many like good people that I know now <laughs> like it was it was a source of so many things this, it's literally why I took YouTube seriously in the first place and why you're seeing this video project now so many years later we still hold this this passion for it because it was a moment it was truly a moment in so many ways from this community inclusion to the icons to the customization at the time and some people like to say that car customization or music or whatever or having certain people will date your game but that's not always a bad thing and i think with 2015 it's a perfect uh moment of time to go back to ah like honestly that's really heartwarming um there is a lot of struggle and strife on that project and this was something that just kind of happened and <laughs> there was so many other fires to worry about mm -hmm. uh that i don't think uh, maybe if maybe if everything was smoother and easier, there would have been more eyes on it. But it kind of just got snuck in, to be honest. Like I did it, and it, I was the one that was in charge of writing these things, so they happened. <laughs> um, and I think the other the other side of it is it wouldn't have happened if there wasn't that community that was so passionate about Need for Speed, right? Uh, like if like I, I've made lots of games uh, over the course of my career. Very rarely uh, is there a, an active fan base that's like wanting to talk about it and has strong opinions that ends up finding me right uh which was very unusual uh so to, to have that connection it, it helped inspire and drive what i was doing no pun intended a driving game uh and it only felt right like yeah this is something that is useful and is good for how we're developing this game and that should be something that we just do uh and thankfully everyone else was probably too busy to realize wait a minute is this a good thing or a bad thing? And we have to have like a 12 man committee meeting about it and some crazy shit. Uh, we just did it. <laughs> well, on that note, I might as well go ahead and throw this out there. I interact with the community all the time. I used to be very heavily part of it. I know there are so many people who actually really enjoy to this day, Need for Speed Rivals 2015. It was a very unique and iconic point. It was this milestone in the franchise that a lot of people actually still look back on fan on fondly so from that perspective for the sake of those people i just wanted to go ahead and pass you their thanks because i know a lot of people that really do enjoy this sort of stuff and as you said not a lot of people get to interact with developers and stuff like this in this manner so yeah. so well, just, i appreciate this, this hearing my, it of course <laughs> and like i said i just wanted to give thanks about new year's 2018 again because that's the game that got me to take youtube more seriously i met so many people off it i just want to say thanks again because it genuinely like not not but like being completely serious new year's 2015 did change my life it's, it's amazing it did for a lot of people now that i think <laughs> yeah. about it. it springboarded so many changes for many people like a lot of people became influencers a lot of people actually became more interested in racing games as a whole because of it it's kind of crazy yeah it's it's amazing to know that these types of things we make which are games and they're entertainment can have that kind of impact on people's actual lives and like i feel really privileged to be able to talk to you guys about it but i think like as i mentioned before these are huge teams. There was like two, 250 people making this game at, at its peak. Like hundreds of people put their, their heart into this experience. So I may be talking about it to you now, but it's all of their hard work that made it happen. So it's not a me thing, it's a them thing. <laughs> oh, of course. You're just the communicator in this instance. I'm just the guy you could track down on Twitter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, so James, that was an absolutely amazing experience i'm so glad we got to speak with you so much interesting stuff we learned uh from inside of the development point of view from the psychology of a game designer uh that was a very very great experience and i will be sure to remember it thank you very much for joining us yeah thanks for having me on to talk about this stuff it's great to look back and like 
to hear how well received and how loved a lot of the stuff we were making at the time is most of the developers don't get to hear that and we just mostly live a very stressful chaotic deadline driven life so it's good it's good to know that these things went out there and made people happy and gave people joy that's the point of making these things so yeah thanks it was great to, to think back on that stuff i hope you enjoyed this ride through the hidden story of new Year's Eve 2015. i'm very glad to be able to produce this video showcasing the story and overall celebrating New Year's Eve 2015 and its community. Doing the research and grabbing guests for this video was such a fantastic experience, making this nearly year-long production time worth it. It felt great to revisit this era, reminding myself why I joined this community in the first place, rekindling why I loved racing games, and how I became passionate about making videos years ago. There were actually much more people involved in this story but I couldn't get everyone, so if you want to know everyone that was involved in this, I'll have all of the race names listed down in the description. What came before the reboot, the experience of New Year's Eve 2015, and even what came right after it was a huge inspiration for me getting into game art and development and chasing the degree that I'm currently working on. New Year's Eve 2015's community also led me to meet some people that I still talk to today and have been cemented as some of my best friends. From defining what Nitro Speed was, to being the ultimate time capsule of 2010's car culture, and help shaping what I want to do next, all I have to say is, thank you.